So first of all, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the master class sessions today. This is, uh, this is part of the Women Create Co by Compol program. My name is Chai, and I'm currently the program designer and also partnership lead of Compol. And I will be helping you guys to moderate the today's uh, sessions. Beforehand, uh, if you haven't uh, really know what Women Create is, I'm going to give you a little bit of explanations about it. So this is a series of programs uh, consisting of several sub events, including these master classes that we had today. And we're also going to have a sub program that is a uh, startup and SMEs empowerment. And it will be articulated as a Startup Weekend Indonesia Women Editions. It will be conducted in nine cities in Indonesia and uh, it will be followed by a graduation stay nationally where the selected business will get several intensive classes to scale up their businesses. And I would like to thank the partners who have been supporting us running this program to our supporting partners, Australia Global Alumni and our partner program, uh, program Stellar Woman, who has been putting lots of effort in making this program become a real. So, Today, uh, as you guys might know, and I understand that you also know what we're going to talk about, but let me just uh, reiterate that. We'll be talking uh, into uh, two keynote sessions today. The first one is about how to gain access to the capital you need, and it will be conducted fully in English. Meanwhile, at the second keynote sessions, we will be learning how to manage your money as a business uh, entrepreneur. And as for the second keynote, it will be conducted full in Bahasa Indonesia. And after the keynote session, we will have an interactive Q&A session. I hope you guys uh, will drop your questions on the Zoom chat, or you can just directly uh, you know, unmute yourself during the Q&A sessions later and uh, have a little bit discussions, like, um, you know, like discussions with the speakers is really welcome. So I think I'm talking too much right now. So let's just uh, jump right into our first keynote sessions, which uh, the topic is Financing 101. I'm going to give the stage to Miss Pita Ellis. Uh, but beforehand, I'm going to go through a little bit background about her. So Ms. Pira is a startup community activator and also an ecosystem builder with a history of collaboratively growing the innovation sector across Australia. With a 20 year background in communications, PR, marketing and media relations, also founding four companies before, before 30, she plays a pivotal role in startup ecosystem as a cheerleader, storyteller, super connector and strategist. So as uh, just a little bit information ahead about Ms. Pita, she grew 550% from uh, 2012 to 2019 of River City Labs during uh, her leadership period. And it was acquired at its peak in 2018 by the ACS. The acquisitions enabled the brand to expand into the three hubs across three states. Uh, making it the largest innovation hub network supporting high growth technologies companies in Australia. And as the CEO of ACS Innovation Labs, he built and fostered critical ties with corporates, partners, other private and public entities and their members. Now, uh, she's a co-founder of Tribe Global and Peak Performance Persona. She aims to leverage her expanded network of external stakeholders, engaged communities, and innovative corporates, uh, corporations to continue to build the entrepreneurial spirit in Australia. Welcome, Pita. How are you doing? Thank you very much. I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Pita. So I think uh, your presentation is ready. Okay, so I will. Right. Okay, now you can present. All right, everything seems so cool. Then I'll just give the stage to you, Pita. Please have a great time. Thank you very much. You can see my screen okay? Yes. Excellent. All right. Thank you for having me. And um, we heard a very long introduction just before, but to summarize, 
Uh, I am I am a businesswoman. I have three beautiful children. I am the tri uh, the co-founder of Tribe Global, and also Peak Persona. So we work with individuals, mostly entrepreneurs, and also leaders, to help them transition through change, and also for entrepreneurs to manage their lifestyles whilst they are running a business. Um, I'm also the entrepreneur in residence at the Queensland University of Technology. So I run a lot of programs for people who are looking to leave their full-time job, start a career in entrepreneurship or start their own business. And I also run um, programs at one of the Brisbane and Queensland private girls schools. So I run programs within schools and also for parents. So parents looking to kick off their own businesses whilst their children are at school. Um, I do a lot of facilitation. I'm an educator. I mentor a lot of businesses in their personal life and their business life. And I also build a lot of startup ecosystems. But the biggest thing that I do is I am a humble cheerleader. I'm a marketer and I love telling stories of entrepreneurs or people having a go and starting something interesting. That is what I really love to see most of the time. So today's session, I've been asked to speak around financial management, uh, what, what's involved in getting funding, in bootstrapping, accessing capital, and also team capability, which means what do you actually need on your team to be able to grow and get funded? Now, when we're starting off, some of these topics can seem very boring or maybe daunting or overwhelming. So I'm going to walk you through probably the most simplistic ways to look at these topics. And hopefully you can um, take something away from it. But please also ask questions in the chat window and we can, we can run through those at the end. But first of all, I think before we talk about money or talk about raising capital, or getting some funds in to grow the business, it's very important to look at where are you at? Um, what stage of the business are you at? What stage of growth are you at? And also what type of company do you have? Not every single business is suitable to go and raise capital. Not every business is best suited to have a grant. Not every business is best suited to have external funding. Um, it depends if you are brand new in the idea stage, if you are a freelancer, if you are a creative, are you an artist? Are you selling things online? Are you selling things in a store? Are you making things creatively and selling them person to person in a market? All of, all of these things are going to determine how you actually raise money, how you manage your finances and what the messaging around that is. There is not a one size fits all to raising capital or dealing with money within a business because every single business requires a different style of funding. So what I can tell you is no matter what journey you're on, it is a very rocky road. It's an interesting journey and you will discover a lot about yourself along the way. Um, we, there is no better way to have a deep understanding of yourself and how you operate than other than running a business and taking in all of the colourful life lessons that comes with that. I wanted to also mention at this point in the story, we have heard globally a lot about entrepreneurship and what entrepreneurs look like. And a lot of them look like this. And as you know, these are the poster people all around the world for what startups and entrepreneurs look like. And I hope that definitely after today, and I know this program is targeted to changing what th that story looks like, is I hope we can change this story by making the um, poster people of entrepreneurship look a lot more like this, with a lot more women as founders and a lot more women starting things in an area that makes sense to you. There is no right way, there is no wrong way. These are Australian founders. So in Australia, we have a lot of inspirational women um, telling their story, how they started solving problems, creating businesses off the back of things that they found very challenging. So Janine from Boost Juice, which is now global, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of that uh, brand, but it, she was also one of the judges on Shark Tank Australia, the TV show. Um, she was a mother who wanted healthy 
alternatives for her children when she was out and about that was not junk food and started one small juice bar and now it is a global empire of um, a, a juice business canva i'm hoping some of you may have used canva as a design tool when you're creating logos or flyers or business cards or any design online it is free to use melanie perkins created Canva, and now it is a global design tool. It's one of Australia's unicorn businesses. Um, Carolyn Creswell on the far side, she was 18 years old and working for a muesli company. When that muesli company went bust, she bought the recipe for 2000 Australian dollars and is now one of the leading muesli bar suppliers in one of our largest supermarket chains. So, just to highlight, everybody comes from a very different background. It's not always technology based. It is very much focused on what problem can you solve in the in the world that you are in, in the country that you are in, in the location that you are in. And if there is somebody else experiencing the problem the same as you, you probably have a very good chance of getting your idea up and running. Some other good uh, motivational stories are um, this is a diverse range of women, all very local. I know all of these women. So one is an, ind an Indigenous Australian who is extremely passionate about telling the Indigenous local history story of Australians. And it is now, she has transformed her idea of holding up a mobile phone and telling stories about um, some of our historical locations in Australia. It's now being utilized in schools and teaching young children the history of Australia through the Indigenous stories. Shielded Socks is a founder who is 15 years old and she's a high school student who produces socks with positive messages on the feet which help victims of bullying in the schoolyard to feel more positive and supported in their everyday life. Um, then we have a professional gymnast and athlete who at the end of her gymnastic career found it very difficult to transition to professional athlete um, life into the business world. So now trains other entrepreneurs around the mentality of being an athlete and sports person. And then we have our fitness influencer, which if, if you are on Instagram, you probably would have seen many fitness influencers selling all sorts of programs. Some have businesses behind them, some do not, but the good entrepreneurs use their influence for impact and can sell messages, sell programs, have an impact on countries that are less fortunate than us. And I just wanted to highlight that entrepreneurship looks very different. It, they are everyday people who have had really, really interesting ideas and continued on to do that. So in regards to funding, it's not, as I mentioned before, a one size fits all thing. There is not one method that you follow to go and get money to start your business. Because until you have a look at why you're actually here, what you are actually doing and what you want to achieve, that is going to determine how you get income, how you get funding, what type of customers you have, or whether you can even access any type of a grant. So are you creating a business for a purpose or are you creating a business merely to generate profit? Are you creating a business so that you can have a job? Um, are you looking to impact a certain area? Do you have a passion for impacting underprivileged people in your area? Are you have, do you have a passion to solve the war on waste? Do you have a passion to use sustainable, recyclable fabrics in fashion? Are you passionate about not testing beauty products on animals? Whatever those reasons are, are going to be a key indicator on how you actually get money for your business. Because not all two businesses are the same and it all really comes down to what you actually want to achieve in your business. And not everybody is here for wealth. Not everybody here is to generate income. A lot of us start businesses to have a lot of impact or to influence change or to create opportunities for other people or to simply have an income and create a small business that will allow you to be employed in an area where you normally can't get employment. So all of these factors really should be taken into consideration well, well before you look at how to actually get money for, for your business and for your idea. 
So with funding, there is a few different options. We have one option, which is our favorite, which is how can you actually generate revenue from customers? That is the easiest and most simple way to generate revenue. How can you get a customer to pay you for what you are making, building, selling, or teaching, or creating? If you can get a customer to pay you for your idea or your product or your service, that is the easiest and the best way to make money because it is a relationship direct with you and your customer. Sometimes that isn't a very fast way of growing, but it's definitely very, um, it's a holistic way of growing, but it's also um, gives you direct feedback that the service or the product that you are creating is something that people actually want. Another way that you can generate revenue is what we call uh, pre-sales or crowdfunding. Sometimes if you are creating a brand new product that's going to cost money to build, so if you're building something that's creative or if you are recording an album and you wanted to have people pre-purchase copies of your book, pre-purchase copies of your album, uh, pre-purchase any sort of a product that will, re will require capital to make, you can do a crowdfunding campaign to have people pre-purchase that product so that you can get the money, then take it to wherever it needs to get manufactured or built, make the product and then send it to the people afterwards. And I'll run through that in a little bit detail, a little bit more detail afterwards. There's also options to get funding via grants from governments, councils, private sectors, large corporations. There are a lot of grants who are looking to increase business in the regions, in local areas to encourage women to launch businesses or anybody who has a unique and different idea. There are a lot of government support out there. It depends what sector that you are involved in. Anything to do with any of the um, environmental issues, sustainable issues, domestic violence, healthcare, health sciences, anything that is going to make the world a better place. There is often grants out there that are available. For example, this program in particular is funded via grants because the government is interested in investing more into female entrepreneurship. So if this, this program was your business idea, it is an option to get government funding to run a program like this. And that in itself is a business and that is an entrepreneurial concept to be able to do those types of things. There's also different governments, different areas have tax rebates, financial incentives for launching businesses, which allow you sometimes to not pay as much tax as other businesses if you are starting out. So in Australia, we have got different rules to what your country has and it's it's very important to have a look into what ways that all of those types of businesses attract funding. So that's why it's important to know exactly what you are, what you want to achieve, and who is going to give money to the type of business that you are. Because we can't all assume and pitch for funding as if we are, st are a startup, if you're not actually a startup by the very definition of being a repeatable, scalable business model. So those sort of things are very important to take into consideration in the beginning. So when I talk about repeatable, scalable business model, what I mean is when you have an idea and you launch it into the market, you're testing and you're talking to customers and you're getting feedback. Sometimes they pay you. They go, this is a great idea. I like what you're building. Here is my money. I want to buy one. That is what we call validation they're saying yes I want your product yes I will use this service I love it so much I will pay for it that is what we do in this testing learning phase of the beginning at the beginning which is what we call um, the customer discovery the customer validation phase we do this a lot until we have a, a business model that works and then we can add more fuel to the fire by money more people larger operations and scale it and grow it to be quite large. So things like Facebook, Amazon, Twitter, um, any of the services that we all use on our phone, on our computer, Slack, um, any of those smaller services were 
created from a problem that somebody had and somebody came up with a solution to those types of problems. They tested it in the market. They launched a very small version of it. They proved that it works. Lots of people wanted to use it. They could prove that the model was scalable with better tech or more people and which required more money, which will allow that business to grow. Now, if you are a business where you are selling things at the markets or you are opening a shop, so a bricks and a bricks and mortar shop or a shop that sells clothes and you are just open the door and you rely on customers to come in, that is not something we would call scalable. What would make it scalable is if you had an online store as well, which means you have the ability to utilize that one location and sell to a huge global market because the online capability is the one thing that will take your small business to being a global business because you have the ability to sell 24 seven to every single country, as long as you have a presence online and you manage the logistics and the delivery and the marketing and the presence in all of those locations. So until you can scale, then you're not going to really attract a large amount of funding because the large amount of funding is designed to allow you to grow very rapidly. You may receive a grant to start something, but then the growth money is going to be the scalable money. And that's that's really the most simple way to think of it right, right in the beginning. One other way to get funding uh, and a different way or a different type of a business that requires funding is something we call a social enterprise. So social enterprises um, are something that has a higher purpose or a bigger purpose. So Jack Ma, the founder of Alibaba, uh, states that making sustainable money while being responsible to the society and improving the world is a very difficult thing to do. Making money is one thing. Giving people product is one thing. But can you actually make a difference? Can you improve the world? Can you be sustainable, ethical, and socially responsible for the type of business that you are operating. Social enterprises usually have some sort of a community focus. They are profit for purpose. So you can make money, but as long as the money is funneled into a purpose or a community project or a higher mission or an innovation that is going to fundamentally change the way we do things or impact people in an area that um, maybe have been doing things one way for many, many years and it's an innovation that's going to really change the way that whole societies operate. There's lots of different ways that you can um, to have get involved with social enterprises and a lot of people think that if you are a not-for-profit, it means that you don't make any money. Now, that's not entirely true because you need to make money to make the business work. It just means you don't take the profit out of the company. The profit keeps circulating within the business to continue the business growth or the impact it needs to be having. A new term is called profit for purpose. So you are very boldly okay with making money and you are aimed to make money, but it is for a purpose, it is for a mission, and it's aimed to impact something other than your own back pocket or your own income or your own bank balance. So here are some examples that uh, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody's aware of these brands, but um, they are global examples of very small ideas that have grown. I'm going to talk about their funding model because they're also different. And this is why it is not a one size fits all with getting money. So the Orange Sky Laundry two founders in this slide here. They, they were founded in Brisbane, is the town that I'm, I'm in. They wanted to help homeless people on the street, um, not by giving them food, not by giving them shelter, but they identified a need of homeless people is they did not have the ability to wash clothes. They didn't have access to wash any clothing, so they created one van with washing machines in the back of it, and they drove around to all of the pla pla places where homeless people sleep, and they would stay there for a few hours and allow those homeless people to wash their clothes. Now, the Brisbane City Council wants the lives of the people on the street or the homeless people to be better. Because if we can help increase their standard of living a little bit, that is in the best interest of the council. So the council funded 
with a, by virtue of a grant that for this business to operate. Corporate companies also wanted to have a social positive impact on the local city in which they're conducting business. So they also gave this business a grant to continue operating. They started off with one van, then they went up to 10 vans. Now they supply showers on, on the, in the back of a van for homeless people um, in five different countries. So it's not just Australia anymore. They have scaled it across the globe. They are now in America. I think they're in the UK um, as well as across Australia. And it's, they use grants for the local governments and councils, and they also get corporate sponsorship because corporates, although they make a lot of money, they also need to be seen to be having an impact and giving back to their community. And they, Orange Sky makes it easy for them to have a direct impact into the community in which they also make money. So that is their funding model. They don't have no other revenue stream other than grants, community grants, corporate grants. The Who Gives a Crap Toilet Paper Company had a higher purpose of wanting to build toilets in third world countries who do not have access to basic sanitization. They wanted to create and build toilets in areas where there weren't any. So they did that by selling toilet paper to everybody else who needs it in every other country who wants to buy toilet paper with 100% of the profits going to funding new projects in countries that do not have basic sanitization. So again, they make money, but 100% of the profit goes back in to having a huge impact into a region that cannot afford to do that on their own. So that is their business model. They are funded by customers, not by grants and not by corporate money. But it also means the customer, when I buy toilet paper, I know I'm having an impact somewhere that makes a difference to me and feels I would much rather buy that brand toilet paper than the other brands in the, in the supermarket where those companies are not having any sort of a social impact at all. The Keep Cups, um, she was a business owner who operated a lot of restaurants in Melbourne and she felt very wasteful of having lots of takeaway cups and plastic. So created the Glass Keep Cup, which is now a big brand um, all around the world of sustainable cups for coffee and has had a huge amount of impact on the war on waste and now no longer runs the restaurants, only runs campaigns to reduce waste and make restaurants and cafes responsible for all of the waste that they're producing. So again, she's funded by customers, powered by a purpose, has no external funding, has no grants, has no um, other mechanisms to fund other than being driven by a higher purpose more than just making money. But they are all very successful businesses. So, so understanding in your own business, going back to your own concept or the idea that you're working on, it's really important to have a look at why you actually exist because that is going to attract not only the right type of customer, but even the right type of staff and team members that you may want to join you on the mission. It might attract the right type of corporate partner or somebody else who may be looking to fund your mission. But if you don't have a mission, it's very difficult for people to fund you. Sometimes people get funded because their idea is interesting and they can see an opportunity for it to grow and that investor has the ability to make their money back by investing into your company. But there is a different higher level purpose on looking at funding is, is it the right money for you? Yes, you can get money, but are they the right investors? What do those investors stand for? What do they believe in? Does their vision and goals align with yours and where you want to take your company? What is the impact you want to have? Does that align with the investor's mission as well? All of these things are really, really important to understand when you're starting out. It's important to come up with a, either a vision or a mission statement. Very, very simple, not, very, not involved, but more so that you have a clear understanding on why it is that you're even starting a business, why it is that you want to grow, and what area of impact do you want to have. So a vision statement focuses on tomorrow. What is the big vision that you want to see? Entrepreneurs are very visionary. So often we can see things in the future that others cannot see. We have a vision to create change. We have got a vision to do things differently. And the mission 
is what we're doing today to get towards that mission. And these are how these two things work. And this will make a difference in your marketing. It'll make a difference in your um, pitch when you finally pitch for what it is that you are doing because there is the everyday purpose of what your business actually does, but then why you want to do it. Some examples of some companies' visions compared to their mission statement. So, for example, Tesla. Their vision, their big, bold, futuristic vision is to accelerate the world's transition to sustainable energy. So it says nothing about cars, nothing about cars or electric cars. They want the world to move to sustainable energy. That is their big vision. Their mission right now is to create the most compelling car company of the 21st century by driving the world's transition to an electric vehicle but their vision is bigger than the car. So in your own business, what vision do you have that is bigger than your business itself? How are you going to influence change? What impact are you going to have? Patagonia outdoor wear, if you are into the outdoors or hiking, uh, camping, travel, they have a big mission um, which works on the vision of that they have a love of the wild and beautiful places of the world. Um, and it demands participation in the fight to save them. So their vision is all around saving the natural resources that we have. So everything they sell goes towards funding that's going to save our natural resources, even though they're in the business of selling raincoats, hiking boots, hiking gear, travel gear. Really, their funding and their vision is to save the planet that we are on. Now, that makes me want to buy that brand. It makes, when I go into a store and I've got five brands in front of me, I will choose this one because I know their vision is an alignment with who I am. And this all comes back to the type of customers you attract, the type of marketing that you want to put out there. It'll help you craft your marketing message and mm -hmm. it will help you attract the right money as well. Right. Amazon which I'm sure we've all used Amazon, seen Amazon at some point. Yes, they are all over the internet. We buy things off Amazon. We listen to Amazon via Audible. But their vision is to be the Earth's. Did you notice Earth? Not, not the world. Mm -hmm. um, not our country. Not America. Not Australia. Not Indonesia. It's the Earth. It's most customer-centric company where customers can find and discover anything online that they might want to buy. Now, that vision isn't new. That vision came to them probably five years ago. And it's only now today that we can possibly look on the internet and buy pretty much anything. Right. And in another five years time, it'll probably accelerate to be even more again. But again, they are an online store, but their vision is to really connect every single thing that you see with something that you can buy. So understanding that your values will come back to your culture. The culture starts with the founders, but then will definitely grow and evolve over time. But who you are, what you do, and what you achieve will determine who funds you. Is it going to be your customers? Is it going to be grants? Is it going to be corporate partners? Is it going to be angel investors? All of these things, unless you know your why, it's very difficult to start chasing the money. Because if you are very clear on that, then you know who to ask for money from because if their mission aligns with yours it's going to halve the time that it takes to start um, searching for dollars so in terms of customers you can bootstrap we need to validate we need to understand the sales channels and markets what existing platforms are out there already how do we actually market um, and communicate what it is that you do what you're selling why you do it and then of course on the back of all of those things we actually grow and we have product market fit, and then we can scale. And then once we scale, we can get more money into the company. But those steps need to be sorted out first. Most people jump straight to funding and they forget the beginning bit. So they go and get the money and they realize I've got this money now, but I've lost alignment somehow, or I've got this investor, but they're pushing me to push the product this way. And I don't really want it to go that way. But really, you've got the wrong investor in the first place. You've got the people who aren't aligned with your mission and story. They don't understand what you wanted to achieve because you didn't actually clarify in the beginning what, what it is that you were there to do. So bootstrapping is 
going back to our very first point, funding by customers, building the most basic version of your product that you possibly can, testing it, talking to customers, getting feedback, going back and making the product better, testing it again, getting feedback, going back and making the product better again, and doing this loop over and over and over again until you get a product that everybody loves and you know now you are ready to add your rocket fuel, you are ready to throw more people at it, better technology, a bigger team, which will, will usually require more money. And that is when we start to go down the funding route. But you can't even do that until you've actually got a nice validated product and funding and um, working funding model. The other model that I mentioned, if you are developing a product or if you are developing something that is going to cost money to build, crowdfunding is an option for you, which means you can allow people to pre-purchase your product. This is also a tool to validate. So if you have an idea or you wanted to create, for example, this Pebble watch, this is a very old example, but we use it because it, it explains the concept. Now we have smart watches. Most of us have smart watches. There are all of the brands of watch now make smart watches. Back when Pebble was created, it was, it was quite a brand new thing. It was very rare. So the makers of Pebble, instead of going and building a watch and hoping people would buy it after they spend it, millions of dollars making them, they put a crowdfunding campaign and they said, here's the watch, here is all the features it's going to have. This is what it would do. You can pre-purchase one now, which means, let's say if it was $150, I went on and pre-purchased my $150 watch. I put in my order and I know I'm going to get it in three months time. They then collect all of that money, go and get all the watches built and then ship them to their customers. It's just a way of getting the customers to pre-purchase their products before you even build it. So for a startup, somebody with a new concept, it just means that you are testing the market to say, yes, these people want it so badly, they're ready to pay for it now. Right. So you're getting a, a double win. You're getting your funding from the customer, you're getting validation that they want it. One problem that most people come up against though is underestimating how much it costs to create their product because it's brand new. I'm working with a company at the moment who is crowdfunding a campaign for some educational learning cards that they're using in schools to teach entrepreneurship to students. Um, now, that's quite an easy thing to, to work out. Each deck of cards might cost $10 to make and I'm going to sell them for $30. So I know that there's going to be profit in there. So they're pre-selling all of those decks of cards. So she knows then how many to go and make out of a factory somewhere in China. Um, and then once they're all made, then they get shipped direct to the customer. So we're pre-purchasing. All it means is there is a delay in the time that I buy it to the time that it gets to me. That's right. an easy thing to, to work out. I've looked at some tech products where they've had an estimation of the product. Let's say it's $50, but it actually costs $100 to make, which means they're going to be underfunded. So they cannot deliver the product to their customer. So those sort of things, if you're building a product that's very involved in technical, mm -hmm. um, working out how much it costs to build, it is probably the toughest thing in doing a crowdfunding campaign. And on the back of putting up a crowdfunding campaign on a page, you need to um, do a lot of marketing and public relations to drive people to the page so they even look at it. It doesn't just go up there and magically get funded. You have to do a big marketing push on the back of it to get it funded as well. So there's lots of- uh, Sorry, we're having like a three more minutes. So yeah. Okay, sure. So crowdfunding is one way, bootstrapping is one way, um, taking on investment from external. So angel investors, venture capital is the next step. And without going too deep into those, what's important to know is, are you ready? to take on investment, which means this. Do you have people? Do you have a team? Unless you have a team to deliver what you are promising you are going to build, you're not ready to take on capital. As an individual, to go and raise capital is a big task in itself. And 
then delivering what you say you're going to build is an even bigger task and you need the right people on board to be able to do that. So understanding who's on the team, how can you deliver this? Are you ready to take on the capital? Um, going into raising venture capital and angel investment is a science. There is templates, you need to go on a specific journey. Um, and it's worth investing the time into getting some guidance around those types of things. Mm -hmm. Here's a very quick snapshot on what it looks like. So what we call our family and friends round, people we know, people who trust us, people who believe in who we are and they will back us. They will give us the first little bit of funding to get across the round. Then we have our seed money. Then we have our series A rounds. Then we have our series B then we have our Series C. They're all very, very involved. There is a lot of information out there on these. Your mm -hmm. ones and your focus would be our friends and family, then our seed rounds to begin with. And Series A is what you're looking up to, up to one between one and $2 million Australian US um, initially. Here's what I found. And then after that, it is gets very involved from Series B to Series C. Mm -hmm. here's some indication of some of the amounts that are an indicator of what some of those rounds of funding look like um, but it, it varies for different sectors it varies for different countries but this is an americanized version of standardizing what a seed round looks like what a series a looks like and what a series b ends up looking like um, this is just a quick snapshot on where you start from idea, you find a co-founder, you have family and friends invest, you start to raise some seed capital, then you start growing to series A and you grow significantly. Then you can obviously grow to series C. Maybe an IPO is when you list on the public stock market, which is the end game of, of raising capital, which is very, very far away from where we're all at right now. But I wanted to show you there the, the pathway, the trajectory of how some of these companies grow and go um, but we're really down the idea stage and getting the messaging right at that beginning part is key to that so choosing investors make sure that you choose wisely wisely make sure they are aligned with your vision make sure they are the right people for you building relationships early is key from everywhere so from this discussion today connect with me on LinkedIn if you are watching this and you wanted to reach out to me on LinkedIn and say I watched your presentation on funding, that is your first connection. You never know where we meet today, where that's going to end in the future. I've had people I've known for the last 10 years who have gone and raised capital from people they met very briefly at a networking event or something that became a pivotal person in their journey to raising capital. So don't underestimate small introductions along the way. That is the end of my uh, presentation. If you want to reach out to me, please do. These are my contact details. I'm very active on Twitter. LinkedIn, of course, that is my direct email. I'm more than happy to re receive emails and questions. I love working with female founders and um, I'm more than happy to, to talk to you at any time and share any of this information in more detail. Right. Thank you, Pita, for sharing with us. Uh, I'm taking notes like there is a real interesting part that you have highlighted during your presentations. And for those who have joined, I um, might want to have a, a little bit of um, summary in Bahasa. Uh, so probably like uh, people will also know uh, what the context is. Jadi uh, buat teman-teman mungkin uh, kita ada beberapa hal yang sudah tadi di uh, bahas ya uh, sama Miss Pida uh, regarding dengan uh, funding apa aja sih yang harus dilihat uh, kemudian defining startup juga bahwa startup itu bukan cuman ketika kalian mencoba untuk membuka atau membuat bisnis baru kalian tapi make sure bahwa uh, bisnis kalian itu bisa scalable dan juga uh, punya replicable uh, growth kemudian regarding dengan atau terkait sama funding ada beberapa opsi yang tadi juga sudah dibahas uh, including Uh, revenue dari customer, kemudian crowdfunding, kemudian grants, uh, kemudian dari uh, pajak uh, atau inisiatif, uh, sorry, insentif pajak, dan juga ada investment funding. Dari uh, revenue dari customer sendiri, 
uh, kalian bisa melakukan bootstrapping atau uh, selain itu juga ada crowdfunding yang tadi sudah sempat dibahas uh, itu khususnya buat teman-teman yang bikin produknya itu adalah uh, produk-produk yang bisa dibayar dahulu kemudian nanti customernya bisa uh, punya uh, produknya setelah produk teman-teman ini jadi nah itu juga jadi salah satu jembatan untuk teman-teman bisa validate ide kalian masing-masing uh, A lot of things uh, has been discussed uh, later. I will also touch base again during our before our Q&A sessions. But as of right now, I will welcome uh, our second keynote speakers. Thank you once again, Pita, for sharing with us. Uh, you might uh, want to stay uh, after the second keynote uh, to have a Q&A sessions and discussions with our audiences here. So, moving to our second uh, keynote speakers, we have. Um, ben Siaputra, so he is a well-rounded and also certified professional in providing financial services related to corporate finance activities, debt and equity fundraising, uh, business valuations and financial modeling, and there's a lot of financial, uh, you know, uh, terms that he is also mastered at. And as you uh, guys might know, if you already uh, look up to Ben Siaputra's uh, LinkedIn, he is now also uh, founding a uh, his own ventures, I believe. He's combined uh, experience as a consultant, auditor, banker, and uh, founder, as I mentioned, opens his opportunity to connect and learn from various entrepreneurs, C-level executives. So he has lots of connections. You might want to learn as well how to get that and you know, how to really utilize your uh, connections as well. Hi, Ben, are you here? Yeah, hello, hi. Hai, right. right, right, apa kabar? Uh, oh. So, Ben nanti bakalan uh, bawain, apa hmm. namanya, sesinya in Indonesia. Ya, yeah, in bahasa ya. Ini adalah little advisors. So, you guys nanti enjoy the sessions about money management one-on-one -on -one for entrepreneurs. Gimana sih? Karena kebanyakan nih uh, founders, like lots of founders are mixing up mm -hmm. between like their own money and then like company's money. So, yeah, Ben, go ahead. Mungkin bisa langsung di... Uh, share ya presentasinya. Oke, okay, just a moment. Anyway, I just want to uh, remind uh, teman-teman nanti kalau misalkan ada pertanyaan nih, mumpung belum lupa gitu bisa ditaruh aja dulu di dalam uh, chat box ya. Nanti akan ada teman kita yang akan uh, handle dan juga create the questions. Nanti aku akan bantu untuk sampaikan uh, to Bans or to Miss Tira. All right, uh, Ben, the Zoom is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, um, kenalin, nam, nama saya Ben Siaputra. Well, I used to work with uh, PwC and Ernst Young. Saya dulu kerja di uh, PwC, kalau pernah dengar, dan Ernst Young. Um, bidangnya di audit and advisory work as well, um, dan juga consulting. Um, saya kerja kurang lebih 8 tahun di sana, and then... Um, I try to find my find my passion di uh, startup and everything. Terus um, saya uh, resign and I start my career trying to building uh, my own business lah di um, salah satunya di Little Advisor sini. Nah, terus um, banyak belajar dari pengalaman saya sebagai konsultan dulu. Um, bagaimana sih cara memanage um, financial, including fundraising, performing financial due diligence kalau kalian pernah dengar ataupun um, Bagaimana layas dengan bankers untuk melakukan debt fundraising lah ibarat katanya. Nah, um, akan aku mulai dari mungkin um, topik yang aku bawa adalah saat money management 101. Um, sebenarnya sih paling saya kasih quick overview apa aja sih yang akan aku bawakan dari uh, discussion point saat ini. Nah, pertama um, sebagai startup founders itu kan kita uh, harus tahu ya um, jika kita dapat uang seed funding apa sih yang harus kita lakukan? Dan penting banget cara mengelola keuangan dari startup itu supaya um, kita nggak ujung-ujungnya kita perlu tahu nih berapa sih runway kita. Nanti bakal dijelasin tentang apa itu runway, um, apa itu burn, um, burn rate, supaya tahu apakah um, company ini kita sebelum menemukan product market fit itu uh, butuh waktu berapa lama jika uh, teknologi itu represent teknologi startup yang trying to find a product market fit product. 
Yang pertama, um, ini quick overview-nya aja dulu. Um, kita akan bahas important dari money management, terus strateginya bagaimana sih buat uh, ngelola keuangan itu sendiri. Lalu um, nanti aku bakal sharing tips-tips sih, apa aja yang sih yang bisa dilakukan oleh founders untuk mengelola ke- keuangannya. Nah, lalu ada sih beberapa tools apa aja yang bisa digunakan untuk uh, memastikan bahwa um, you have a proper bookkeeping, kamu punya bookkeeping yang proper, dan um, budgeting yang proper. Nah, nanti juga kita bakal adakan sedikit uh, case study ya, discussion. Uh, nah, ini mungkin um, perlu um, mohon interaksinya nih, coba. Coba kira-kira bagaimana sih, uh, misalkan kalau saya mau ngitung, um, apa namanya, kalkulasi uh, runway atau burn rate lah. Oke, okay. um, sebenarnya pada saat startup yang mampu berhasil, yang mampu, mampu scale up itu, biasanya dia paling tahu tentang berapa pentingnya money management. Kenapa? Karena pada saat kamu dapat, contohnya seperti Pita udah explain tentang kamu udah dapat nih prinsip funding lah dari misalkan contohnya um, keluarga kamu lah. Udah keluar dari kamu, kamu udah mau siap nih mobile bisnis lah. Bisnis apapun, either itu uh, small business or medium business or even startup. Um, kamu udah harus punya plan nih. Karena kan pasti kamu melakukan pitching lah ke mereka. Um, plan kamu seperti apa untuk melakukan budgeting ini? Uh, budgeting ini plannya seperti apa? Misalkan kamu mau buka... Um, sebuah kedai kopi lah kedai kopi mau coba seperti bikin kopi kenangan nah, apa yang kamu lakukan untuk membuat kopi kenangan itu supaya bisa scale up um, atau apa yang kamu bakal lakukan um, jika mau buat bikin uh, food product itu supaya bisa scaling up bagaimana cara kamu bisa sustain the business gitu nah ini uh, menjadi key concern dari um, apa namanya investor juga lah karena kalau kamu nggak uh, dia tahu even though kamu backgroundnya F&B atau background kamu cukup uh, menguasai dari segi teknis tapi kamu nggak punya bidang finance tapi paling enggak kamu harus punya basic um, basic basic um, cara untuk melakukan uh, mengelola keuangan kamu lah jangan sampai nanti ujung-ujungnya um, mereka cannot, cannot get get their money back atau even kalau kamu modalin sendiri kamu malah hi, uh, hilang semua uangnya gitu nah um, nah kemampuan pada saat startup untuk mengelola keuangan sampai dia menemukan produk market fit yang buat menghasilkan revenue, itu menjadi kritikal. Karena um, biasanya itu akan menentukan berapa lama runway-nya dia dan berapa uh, besar burn rate per bulannya. Gitu. Nah, cash dan budgeting yang baik itu juga memastikan bahwa um, semuanya itu akan well done. Gitu. Misalkan berapa allocate yang ke marketing. Uh, dari marketing ini berapa sih conversion-nya. Nah, hal-hal ini itu harus sangat diperhatikan dalam budgetingnya. Jadi kalau bisa kamu juga make sure uh, membuat kayak um, over or under budget variance dari um, pengelolaan keuangan tersebut gitu. Okay, next. Nah ini salah satu strateginya kalau kamu pertama kali mau buka uh, startup lah. Contoh let's say um, you want to make a, a apa namanya a tech startup. Nah terus apa sih biaya-biaya yang esensial bagi kamu waktu kamu uh, bikin tech startup ini? Misalkan kamu butuh biaya untuk pendirian PT. Nah jika kamu butuh biaya pendirian PT, uh, berapa sih costnya untuk pembelian PT, pendirian PT itu? Nah terus jika kamu membutuhkan like a website design atau uh, ada cost seperti uh, mungkin bikin kartu nama atau whatever it is. Nah kamu harus merekap dulu tuh biaya-biaya yang esensial yang akhirnya yang bisa membuat, membuat kamu uh, mendapatkan um, produk market fit itu sendiri. Nah, itu yang harus dipikirkan dulu, setup cost-nya itu berapa. Nah, terus jika kamu punya startup atau kamu punya bisnis yang sudah berjalan, contohnya kamu punya bisnis um, restoran chain yang cukup besar, um, nah, terus kamu bisa tuh mulai analisa nih, kamu pengen scaling up, kamu pengen mem- memperbesar chain kamu, kamu pengen ingin melakukan franchise atau ada bisnis kamu, coba kamu analisa dulu laporan keuangan yang kamu punya saat ini, kira-kira kondisi keuangannya bagaimana sih arus kasnya bagaimana sih cukup lancar nggak kalau kamu tahu um, kal- kalian tahu bahwa arus kas itu kan biasa kalau dari segi keuangan kita dibagi ada tiga macam pertama ada arus kas dari segi of aktivitas operasi arus kas yang berasal dari aktivitas investasi dan arus kas yang berasal dari aktivitas pendanaan nah dari tiga arus kas ini coba tentukan sih sebenarnya um, seberapa Besarkah cash flow yang dihasilkan atau arus kas yang dihasilkan dari aktivitas operasimu dan seberapa besarkah arus kas yang kamu sudah investasikan ke dalam aset-aset contohnya seperti um, kamu beli properti, kamu beli mesin-mesin untuk buat uh, bikin baking, 
Nah, kamu beli alat buat uh, mesin kopi. Nah, itu salah satu bentuk uh, investasi yang sudah kamu lakukan. Nah, lalu satu lagi adalah pendanaan. Nah, pendanaan ini kamu dapat financing dari mana? Jika kamu mendapatkan pinjaman dari bank, jika kamu mendapatkan um, pendam, pinja, apa? pendanaan dari investor. Nah, hal-hal seperti ini coba kamu gali dulu, dibagikan dulu, dan kamu nanti bisa nentuin nih sebenarnya uh, ke depannya Um, pelancaran arus kas kamu seperti apa gitu itu perlu kamu gali dulu sebelum kamu menentukan bagaimana rencana kamu akan melakukan scaling up the business gitu nah terus setelah kamu udah dapat informasi historis ini selanjutnya apa yang kamu lakukan adalah uh, bikin desain sebuah financial projection nah projection ini bisa ditentukan dari contohnya kamu sudah mempunyai ekspektasi growth rate dari sebuah bisnis kamu yang sudah berdiri atau jika bisnis ini masih bisnis yang baru dan kamu belum tahu Bagaimana cara melakukan um, seberapa besar growth-nya itu? Nah, apa yang kamu bisa lakukan adalah sorry, sorry. Nah, kamu bisa lakukan adalah mencari benchmark, benchmark dari um, proyeksi dari startup yang sejenis. Misalkan um, kalau pernah tahu, contohnya pada ada sebuah bisnis uh, kedai kopi chain lah, kedai kopi. Nah, kedai kopi ini kira-kira menghasilkan berapa besar ya revenue-nya ya. Nah, kira-kira growth-nya seberapa besarnya. Nah, ini kan bisa jadikan benchmark kalau kalian mau buka kedai kopi lagi, apakah potensial market-nya itu masih kamu bisa serve? Apakah ada total addressable market yang cukup yang buat kamu masih bisa um, gaining optimable, achievable market yang cukup bagi kamu gitu. Nah, ini harus dibuat yang realistis karena jika kamu buat itu Um, terlalu berlebihan karena tujuannya kebanyakan startup founders itu membuat sebuah growth rate yang terlalu uh, fantastis lah fantastis yang enggak realistis akhirnya tuh jadinya karena tujuannya untuk menggain investor akhirnya jadinya tuh um, nggak pada saat nggak kecil investornya itu jadi kecewa mana buktinya gitu loh mana buktinya kamu bisa menghasilkan growth seperti ini jadi lebih baik kamu mencari benchmark yang realistis sehingga um, investor itu juga menjadi percaya kepada uh, jika berinvestasi pada kamu. Gitu. Nah, terus seperti yang berikutnya adalah pada saat kamu melakukan funding, pastikan bahwa alokasi yang kamu allocate itu untuk memaintain growth rate-nya itu cukup. Contohnya, pada saat kamu uh, requesting for a funding, actually you are planning for a scaling up. Kan? Kamu berencana menggrow bisnis kamu. Jika kamu ingin melakukan franchise, kamu ingin melakukan franchise ke beberapa kota lah contohnya. Um, tapi the question is Pada saat melakukan franchise itu kan ada biaya. Misalkan kamu melakukan digital marketing, butuh melakukan um, biaya-biaya seperti Instagram ad atau Facebook ad. Atau juga kamu butuh melakukan roadshow, kamu butuh visit ke, ke kota-kota tertentu untuk memperkenalkan produk kamu. Nah, hal-hal seperti ini kamu harus tentukan dulu sebelum kamu menentukan, oh, uangnya mau dikeluarin 1 miliar. Nah, 1 miliar itu bakal dipakai untuk apa? gitu. Nah, jika biaya-biaya tersebut kalian nggak analisa secara dini apa yang terjadi adalah semua cost itu jadi wasted begitu aja berapa sih konversinya misalkan kamu melakukan Facebook ad berapa sih konversi rate yang kamu bisa achieve nah hal-hal se ini perlu kamu lakukan supaya um, pada saat penggunaan uang itu penggunaan uangnya itu tepat guna jadi nggak akan salah gitu nah seperti aku bilang tadi serap cost yang perlu dipertimbangkan itu seperti kayak biaya administrasi jika kamu ada biaya marketing awal yang kamu mau lakukan perizinan atau registrasi dan IP registration karena kan um, jika kamu mendirikan teknologi startup itu kan ada biaya-biaya seperti database um, kamu mau register dulu ke Depkom Info everything nah itu make sure kamu udah prepare apa aja sih biaya-biaya yang akan keluar jadi nggak langsung main um, kebut aja kalau misalkan banyak kan beberapa startup itu ya udah hajar dulu hajar dulu nah hajarnya dulu itu yang kadang-kadang ujung-ujungnya kebanyakan gagal karena mereka nggak well plan gitu mereka nggak tahu ke- kegunaan uangnya itu buat apa aja sebenarnya nah ini salah satu uh, beberapa komponen laporan keuangan yang kamu consider perlu gitu um, contohnya seperti kamu per- perlu bisnis budgeting lah berapa sih budgetnya misalkan uh, mau bi- bikin sebuah stand um, stand kopi chain itu sewa sewa apa namanya sewa space nya berapa per meter persegiinya nah kos kos ini jika kamu sewa space di sini berapa sih market yang kamu bisa address gitu seperti kamu buka mall di mall ini berapa besar sih visitor visitornya nah jika kamu mau melakukan um, 
seperti um, food delivery, food, food delivery. Nah, food delivery ini melalui uh, cloud kitchen. Nah, berapa sih um, return-nya di wilayah tersebut? Lalu perlu rekap lagi nih. Berapa sih laporan cost-nya nih? Laporan kertas kerja cost-nya. Apa aja sih biaya-biaya yang um, related ke dalam um, bisnis ini? Nah, kamu harus bagi. Caranya gimana? Kamu bagi antara biaya yang variabel dan biaya yang sifatnya fix. Biaya-biaya yang sifatnya fix itu seperti um, contoh sewa sewa kantor jika kamu punya kantor atau kamu sewa cloud kitchen. Nah, ini berapa sih biaya sewa cloud kitchen-nya? Nah, terus ada lagi biaya-biaya variabel ya contohnya packaging makanan. Packaging makanan ini per packaging berapa? Kalau kamu perlu bikin uh, kopi, kopi itu biaya per botolnya itu berapa gitu. Nah, biaya-biaya seperti ini harus dihitungkan dengan matang dan nanti kamu bisa tahu berapa sih margin sesungguhnya dari sebuah bisnis kamu gitu. Nah, lalu ya profit and loss statement itu buat menunjukkan seberapa keuntungan dan ruginya. Nah, terus selanjutnya itu break even analysis itu ya kamu harus nentuin kapan sih modal kamu akan balik gitu. Atau biasanya kita sebutnya payback period kamu berapa lama. Nah, ini return or investment-nya bisa menghasilkan payback period dalam waktu berapa lama gitu. Misalkan kamu bisa membuka op, um, salah satu kedai kopi di sini, kira-kira mungkin bisa payback dalam waktu oh, 8 bulan sudah bisa balik gitu. Nah, itu coba diperhitungkan dulu. Um, bisa kamu lakukan bagaimana cara misalnya, lihat dulu tuh sekeliling lingkungannya itu, ada nggak yang melakukan bisnis yang cukup similar lah. Nggak mesti sama, misalkan kamu mau bikin um, kopi dengan um, kopi dengan ram lah, atau kopi dengan uh, kopi dengan rasa yang unik, yang berbeda gitu. Tapi coba lihat dulu, ada nggak kedai kopi juga yang hasil yang return yang sama nggak kurang lebih. Apakah they, they are doing good gitu. Sebelum opening the same business di situ. Karena otomatis pada saat kamu buka the same business, sebenarnya market kamu bakal kebagi between kamu dengan um, um, apa kompetitor kamu. Nah, beginning balance sheet. Nah, ini adalah jika kamu sudah mempu, udah mau establish sebuah bisnis yang sudah jalan, tentuin nih um, posisi keuangan kamu tuh sepertinya apa aja. Berapa sih dana yang kamu punya? Berapa sih kas yang kamu punya? Berapa sih hutang yang kamu punya terhadap vendor-vendor, kira-kira dengan kondisi seperti ini, dengan kondisi seperti ini, kamu punya working capital atau modal kerja yang cukup nggak untuk meran as a whole business gitu? Apakah working capital kamu positif gitu contohnya? Tapi kalau for tech startup biasanya kecenderungannya hal ini kan benar-benar sangat fully support by investors. Tapi kalau for a small business yang lain SME itu Um, hal-hal ini menjadi key concern karena mereka perlu mempunyai um, cash flow yang sustain. Nah, itu harus jadi uh, main concern dari small business karena um, the journey is not about to have like um, product yang scaling up, tapi jernihnya itu bagaimana menghasilkan produk yang laku di pasar, giving a good profit margin. tapi um, bisa scaling um, bisa scale tapi pelan-pelan nggak, nggak seperti teknologi startup yang um, find a business um, yang punya produk market fit and then bisa scaling up karena they finding the right solution itu salah satu nah terus sourcingnya nih nah um, mungkin tuh ya, tadi sudah dijelaskan oleh Pita apakah sourcing kamu dapat bisa didapatkan dari um, family misalkan kamu mau melakukan financing nah financing ini Kamu mau mulai dari biaya kamu sendiri atau bootstrapping, atau kamu mau dapat itu dari family dulu, atau kamu mau coba dari investor luar. Nah, biasanya ini perbedaannya the sourcing ini akan menentukan berapa besar persentase dari apa namanya capital yang akan kamu korbankan. Karena seperti yang kamu kalian tahu bahwa cost of equity itu pasti lebih mahal dan cost of debt itu lebih highly leverage. Highly leverage adalah Kalau kamu mau minjam uang ke bank, ya jika bunga kamu minjam uang ke bank itu 12%, nah bisa jadi kamu minjam ke pihak ketiga itu bisa sampai 25% atau 30% gitu loh. Karena they expecting a higher return karena considering kamu punya level of risk lebih tinggi gitu. Nah, jika kamu melakukan equity fundraising, equity fundraising itu ya tentu cost of equity juga tinggi karena mereka mau expect sebuah return yang multiplier bisa 8 sampai 10 kali di uh, 2 atau 3 tahun gitu. Nah, itu yang salah satu yang kalian harus consider apakah jika kalian menggunakan fundraising low equity 
jangan sampai kalian di take over juga bisnisnya atau ketahuan atau banyak di take over. Nah hal-hal ini yang jadi key concern pada saat um, informasi keuangan apa yang kamu belum butuhkan sebelum melakukan projection di step berikutnya. Nah pada saat kamu udah dapat nih data keuangan yang kamu butuhkan um, historically, apa selanjutnya yang harus uh, kamu lakukan yaitu berapa sih potensial growth dari bisnis kamu? Berapa sih profit yang diinginkan dari produk yang kamu buat gitu. Tapi harus disesuaikan dengan kondisi financial dari startupmu. Nah, banyak kan pada saat ini, pada saat Covid ini, kalau kalian uh, sering dengar banyak sekali startup yang berjatuhan karena uh, mereka fokus on growth, tapi mereka forget to sustain the cash flow. Jadi Um, kalau kalian ketahui, beberapa startup yang cukup besar juga akhirnya terpaksa mendiscount um, the value of their startup uh, for the sake of uh, cash flow. gitu. Nah, hal-hal seperti ini yang um, banyak startup jadi akhirnya belajar, oh, cash flow itu juga just met, uh, it's really matter. Nggak, nggak bisa aku hanya fokus on growth, growth, growth without having any revenue or uh, sustain cash flow. gitu. Karena pada saat... Um, mereka having a crisis seperti COVID-19 ini, nah itulah baru faktor-faktor yang seperti positive cash flow atau sustainable cash flow itu jadi key important things. Nah terus kamu bisa tentukan nih pada saat melakukan projection itu berapa sih margin yang kamu expect atau growth yang kamu expect karena ini akan menentukan berapa sih potensial return yang kamu bisa dapatkan ke depan ke depannya dan itu juga akan menentukan berapa sih value dari bisnis kamu sendiri. Karena kalau um, untuk penentuan dari intrinsic value of the business, itu biasanya kita bisa menggunakan financial projection lalu membuat discounted cash flow. gitu. Nah, makanya pada saat bikin financial projection ini, um, jika investor yang sudah um, investor yang sudah berpengalaman, mereka sudah bisa tahu nih berapa sih value yang paling cocok untuk startup kamu. gitu. Jika kamu sudah provide dia financial projection yang um, um, akurat. Nah, setelah dengan financial projection yang kamu udah uh, susun, biasanya tuh kamu bisa tahu nih uh, planningnya sih berapa dana yang kamu mau. Misalkan um, contohnya pada saat kamu mau grow um, clubhouse lah. Contohnya saat ini banyak yang lagi uh, tren adalah clubhouse nih. Clubhouse saat ini kan kelihatan nggak ada generating revenue, tapi tiba-tiba sudah jadi unicorn. Nah, pada saat dia dapat um, fundraising-nya itu around saya, saya lupa, tapi around millions of dollars itu Nah, itu biasanya dia pasti dia punya plan. Oh, misalkan user aku menambah seberapa bertambah seberapa besar gitu. Nah, um, tekniknya itu bagaimana supaya gain gain traction tapi um, tetap memaintain jumlah user yang bisa masuk ke dalam clubhouse. Contohnya uh, dibatasin hanya exclusivity-nya untuk um, iPhone iPhone maybe iPhone dengan iOS 13 above. Nah, uh, lalu dibatasin dengan hanya satu or uh, satu member itu bisa invite hanya dua orang. Nah, itu salah satu part of the strategy to maintain the burn rate lah. Kalau misalkan makin besar, pasti cost database dan everything itu dia makin besar gitu. Nah, jika kamu sudah mempunyai proyeksi yang um, apa tentang startupmu, nah, uh, proper dana yang kamu butuhkan, ya problem kamu udah selesai. Yang penting kamu udah bisa jelasin nih, uh, startup uh, kamu ini bakal butuh cash flow seberapa besar gitu. Nah, tapi dan kamu bisa sustain misalkan kamu bisa buktikan kalau investor itu pada saat sekarang kamu udah bisa sustain nih dengan kondisi revenue seperti ini itu kan jauh lebih menarik dibandingkan sebuah investasi terhadap startup yang bisa scaling tapi dia nggak tahu bagaimana menghasilkan revenue-nya atau monetization nya bagaimana karena tentunya sebagai investor mereka pasti hoping their money get back gitu nggak mungkin mereka invest to a startup without having any possibility kalau uangnya bakal balik malah atau habis sama sekali gitu. Nah, jika kamu belum punya plan yang cukup jelas untuk uh, let's say but, uh, udah kamu udah punya plan untuk jelas untuk scaling up tapi dan kamu udah proving bahwa ini this is product market fit and bisa scaling up. The second question is bagaimana kamu memaintain scaling up itu. Ya contohnya pada saat clubhouse, clubhouse ini kayak mereka udah uh, bisa scaling up um, Product market fit banyak influencer atau um, top people yang baru joining clubhouse ini karena uh, getting uh, knowledge and everything insight dari uh, uh, um, drop in audio and everything itu. Nah ini kan pasti perlukan seed funding karena pada saat um, 
biaya-biaya yang kayak seperti kayak aku bilang database and everything itu perlu dipastikan bahwa um, bisa buat keran uh, the this product market fit gitu. Nah, um, ini adalah salah satu cara buat kamu berapa sih burn rate dan runway. Nah, seperti aku bilang, burn rate itu adalah biaya per bulan yang kamu butuhkan untuk startup itu bisa menghasilkan income sendiri. Nah, sebenarnya uh, to be exact, burn rate itu adalah monthly cost kamu nih. Misalkan um, contohnya ada uh, sebuah e-commerce, kamu melakukan bisnis um, jual, let's say kamu jual baju. Nah, e-commerce jual bajunya ini, Um, buat memaintain biaya per bulannya itu, misalkan buat biaya maintain database and maintenance or website, dan um, misalkan untuk men-stock inventory and everything, dan marketing, itu berapa sih biayanya dalam sehar, sebulan gitu? Kamu bikin berapa sih burn rate kamu dalam sebulan, uh, termasuk marketing cost and everything, nah terus berapa sih biayanya, uh, berapa sih uang kamu yang bisa kamu lakukan uh, batasnya, sampai uh, benar-benar runway kamu berapa lama sampai dana kamu habis gitu. Caranya gimana? Misalkan kamu dapat funding ada 50.000 dolar, nah kamu bagi dengan biaya kamu per bulan itu, itu itu adalah runway yang kamu punya. Misalkan kamu punya waktu punya waktu sebelum um, another product market fit atau punya waktu untuk melakukan another source of revenue atau another source of funding, itu butuh waktu dalam waktu 10 bulan. Misalkan kamu punya uang 50.000 dan berlit kamu 55.000 dolar, berarti buat um, runway kamu around 10 bulan. Oke, okay. nah ini adalah uh, 10 tips money management yang bisa kamu consider. Contohnya, um, pada saat kamu buat um, perencanaan keuangan terhadap uh, startup kamu, budgetingnya bagaimana? Pertama kali harus mulai dari KPI. Seperti Pita bilang, apa sih visi misi kamu gitu? Nah visi misi kamu itu di align dengan KPI yang kamu mau achieve gitu. Misalkan berapa sih cash burn yang kamu rencanakan? Apa sih hiring matrixnya? Apa sih website matrixnya? Misalkan kamu mengtargetkan sebuah conversion dari customer. Nah, seberapa besar conversion rate-nya? Seberapa besar uh, average revenue per user-nya gitu. Hal-hal ini harus di uh, put sebagai uh, basis analisa kamu pada saat melakukan projection sebab besar monthly recurring revenue-nya hal-hal ini harus di um, di allocate dan bikin projection at least kalian bikin projection kurang lebih satu tahun dulu jika kalian belum bisa bikin projection lebih dua tahun satu tahun aja udah cukup itu akan menjadi dasar untuk kamu um, at least mengetahui berapa sih dana yang kamu butuhkan gitu nah terus bisa kamu lakukan weekly team meeting nah di antara antar founders itu pada saat bikin KPI ini sepengalaman aku adalah um, kalian harus tetap um, sampaikan komunikasi itu komunikasi tentang KPI ini ke tim kamu teman-teman uh, either either your employee either um, the other co-founders or even the investors gitu karena untuk make sure bahwa uh, KPI ini align karena kalau kalian in, kita ignore gitu aja ya kalau misalkan uh, saya sebagai startup founder saya um, cenderung untuk mengignore hard KPI ini saya anggap pada saat saya penyampaian satu kali dan dia sudah tahu tapi uh, selanjutnya kita kita kayak oh, oh ya mereka sudah tahu lah berapa budgetnya dan you don't doing the monitors every week or prep regularly every month gitu yang apa yang terjadi adalah um, kalian akan tiba-tiba overrun nih bisa all, budgetnya overrun and everything overrun um, ternyata runway yang kalian expect adalah 10 bulan tiba-tiba menjadi shorten sampai 8 atau 7 bulan which is kalau uh, sampai nggak dimonitor itu tiba-tiba udah ngaku, terjadi seperti itu nah itu sudah terlambat gitu yang ada nanti ujung-ujungnya syarat kamu bisa filler dan terpaksa tutup atau kalian bisa menurunkan harga value uh, syarat kamu yang sudah berhasil di scale karena uh, desperate of uh, having cash flow seperti Amazon dulu karena dia desperate having cash uh, uh, dia desperate having um, another cash flow another cash flow round atau another uh, uh, apa fundraising round akhirnya dia terpaksa menjual rumah murah dia uh, Amazon Amazon value-nya nah Hal-hal ini harus uh, diperhatikan gitu. Nah, lalu buatlah dashboard gitu, dashboard untuk monitor. Pada saat melakukan weekly team meeting, buatlah chart atau grafik yang dapat memudahkan kamu dalam memantau kinerjanya. Nggak usah lah pakai angka-angka yang terlalu uh, sophisticated, uh, kasih numbers yang terlalu detail and everything. Buatlah sebuah dashboard, chart yang simple. Jadi kalau kamu udah lihat, misal comparison between the budgets on 
and the actual um, cost yang udah terjadi, the actual burn money yang udah lakukan. Nah, itulah buatlah dashboard seperti itu yang quite simple. Jadi gampang buat kamu monitor gitu. Nah, hal-hal ini bisa kamu lakukan jika ada even banyak sekali online management tool yang udah bisa kamu coba gitu. Nah, thoughtful uh, chart of account. Chart of account itu adalah akun-akun atau biaya-biaya yang diklasifikasikan gitu. Misalkan um, ini istilahnya istilah accounting ya. Jadi um, chart, of, chart of account ini kayak misalkan kamu punya biaya-biaya atau pos-pos um, contoh biaya marketing, biaya depresiasi dari aset atau uh, aset ini aset kategorinya apa? Misalkan aset ini tergolong sebagai kas di bank ataukah aset ini tergolong sebagai uang muka atau prepayment. Nah, make sure kategori itu uh, dikategorikan secara tepat karena tujuannya untuk memudahkan kamu dalam melakukan analisa uh, berikutnya gitu. Nah, financial planning seperti aku bilang pada saat udah melakukan projection, planningnya itu harus dikontrol nih. Um, contoh berapa sih actualnya, berapa sih budgetnya. Nah, ini masih relevan enggak dengan strategi yang kamu punya nih? Masih relevan enggak dengan KPI yang sudah di-set? Nah, ini uh, menjadi key concern karena Um, kalau kamu nggak berusaha memaintain ini, jatuhnya tuh nanti kayak aku bilang um, bisa terjadi overrun gitu. Nah lihat setelah terjadi uh, over budget misalkan di satu cases kamu um, pada saat uh, running the business uh, you are already running the digital marketing ad ternyata surprisingly uh, responnya bagus tapi conversion rate-nya rendah. Kamu running um, iklan um, banyak banyak yang klik tapi transaksi nggak pernah happen. Nah, apa yang terjadi ya cost of iklan kamu itu sia-sia gitu misalkan. Padahal ekspektasi kamu punya conversion. Nah, ini biaya-biaya mungkin akan timbul lah pada saat kamu melakukan um, um, apa namanya um, burning the money. Nah, itu coba ditentukan dulu di awal-awal. Termasuk juga kalau kamu mau rekrut nih. Oh, iya um, bisnis kita udah scaling up. Oh ya, kita harus rekrut orang baru. Kita udah nggak bisa kerjain ini sendiri gitu loh. Nah, the question is um, bakal hurting your cash flow apa enggak gitu. Nah, pada saat itu hurting your cash flow, berapa besar runway kamu sampai um, jika kamu hiring orang baru ini dan seberapa produktivitasnya kah orang baru ini bisa um, membantu kamu melakukan scaling up dan akhirnya kamu bisa mendapatkan anda the fundraising gitu. Atau kamu melakukan sewa-sewa aset tertentu. Nah, hal-hal ini misalkan kamu buka Um, another uh, toko atau coffee chain, nah coffee chain ini bisa menghasilkan return seberapa besar. Nah ini harus jadi key concern. Nah control the burn. Nah uh, ini seperti yang diulang-ulang, alokasikan tim yang benar-benar fungsinya untuk memonitor burn rate-nya. Jadi tahu berapa sih burn rate yang um, ideal lah buat kamu, sehingga kamu punya runway yang um, um, ideal juga. Gitu. Halo? Ya. Yeah. Lalu Ya. Lalu coba ketahui juga tentang cap table. Misalkan cap table itu adalah persentase kepemilikan Halo. sahammu. Ya, Halo. Ya. Ada apa? Ya, oke. Okay. Ya, coba ketahui juga cap table kamu ya. Um, jadi cap table ini ada persentase dari saham kamu dan perubahannya investasi. Contohnya ternyata Um, ternyata suatu saat pada saat kamu melakukan um, perlu another fundraising, berapa sih persentase saham yang akan berubah dari kamu? Uh, berapa sih pre-money valuation dan post-money valuation setelah ada injeksi kapital uh, dari uh, investor, angel investor ataupun VC? Lah. Nah, hal ini perlu kamu monitor supaya ke depannya jangan sampai startup kamu diakuisisi oleh uh, angel investornya sehingga kamu di hostile takeover. Nah, kalau udah seperti itu ya um, you don't have uh, you don't own the company again and then um, ya yeah, you already out the business gitu. Nah, ini hal-hal ini yang bisa jadi bahkan mengham sebuah bisnis atau visi misi dari uh, startup kamu gitu. Nah, terus apalagi sih um, yang bisa kamu lakukan untuk memonitor ini semua yang mau bikin jadi kompleks gitu. Yaitu kamu bisa connect punya connecting financial tools karena banyak sekali uh, Financial tools yang bisa kamu gunakan untuk memonitor um, biaya-biaya ini, memonitor projection seperti ini. Nah, nanti saya akan jelasin apa sih connected financial tools yang bisa kamu gunakan um, seperti ya cloud accounting, cloud accounting itu yang kamu bisa gunakan. Gitu. Nah, uh, pertimbangkan juga hiring strategi. Nah, hiring strategi misalkan ternyata uh, kamu butuh orang bookkeeping nih, aku kamu butuh orang admin. Nah, um, mungkin nggak sih pada saat kamu hiring orang admin itu esensial nggak sih? 
um, ternyata kan butuh misalnya UMR di Jakarta itu 4, 4 jutaan ya. Nah, 4 juta 400. The question is, pada saat kamu hiring jangan lupa um, kalau hiring itu berarti kan kamu butuh peran harus bayar biaya gajinya paling jika um, kamu mau ikutin um, apa namanya undang-undang tenaga kerja 4 juta 400, kamu juga harus pertimbangkan THR, kamu harus pertimbangkan PPJS, health insurance and everything gitu. Atau bisa jadi kamu mau meminimize cost itu dengan outsource firm-nya aja gitu. Instead kamu hiring langsung. Nah, ini ada sedikit uh, case study saya ambil dari uh, namanya startup uh, movie K drama. Nah, contohnya ini ada um, Soldalmi nih. Nah, film Soldalmi kalau kalian udah nonton dia baru dapat seed funding sebesar 50.000 US dollar. Nah, terus dia pengen mengembangkan aplikasi AI yang untuk membantu orang kesulitan penglihatan. Nah, um, kalau kalian nonton filmnya itu namanya Nungil gitu loh. Nah, um, Soldalmi ini dia estimasi nih berapa sih buat maintain aplikasi tersebut di App Store nih. Nah, dia men, uh, mengestimasi bahwa rata-rata daily active usernya uh, apa namanya aplikasi Nungil ini kayaknya possible dengan market yang kuat nih itu mungkin sekitar seribu orang nah, seribu orang ini costnya itu adalah 0,1 dolar per orang per hari nah, lalu biaya developer untuk maintenance ini setiap bulannya adalah oh sorry ini nanti 2000 ya bukan 1500 2000 nah jika startup ini belum dapat menghasilkan revenue berapa sih burn rate dan runway startup tersebut kira-kira Ada yang mau coba hitung dulu? Ayo, mau coba hitung sama-sama nggak kira-kira? Berapa sih ban rate? Nah, biaya developer ada 2.000 dolar. Ya. Kira-kira berapa sih ban rate dan runway dari startup itu jika dia belum punya revenue sama sekali? Mungkin kita bisa hitung uh, bareng-bareng aja kali ya. Nancy. Ya, boleh, boleh. Yuk, mau hitung bareng-bareng. <laughs> <laughs> Waktunya cukup ya? Iya. <laughs> <laughs> Waktunya mepet ya, oke. Okay. Gampangnya. Oke. Okay. Nah, pertama kan biaya app maintenance-nya ya. Tadi biaya developer aku revisi ya, aku lupa. Um, aku buletin karena supaya lebih mudah. Nah, biaya app maintenance-nya ada 0,1 dolar kan. Lalu ada 1.000 orang. Nah, lalu oh, dilakukan 30 hari. Nah, total kan 3.000. Nah, biaya developer per bulan itu adalah kan tadi um, aku revisi, jadi 2.000 ya. Nah, burn rate per bulan dari uh, uh, app ini adalah di 5.000 dolar per bulan gitu loh. Nah, sedangkan kalau kita mau tahu uh, runway-nya, kita lihat dari ini. Kayak tadi dibilang sedang mendapat seed funding sebesar 50.000 dan burn rate per bulannya adalah 5.000. Berarti uh, runway yang ini adalah 10 bulan gitu loh. Nah, what if? Ini ada salah satu uh, uh, tips-tips yang kamu bisa gunakan kalau misalkan kamu punya dana nih Kamu punya dana startup um, biasa tuh kebanyakan kadang-kadang pada saat kita punya dapat seed funding kita tuh taruh aja di bank gitu aja. Sebenarnya banyak banyak strategi yang bisa kamu lakukan dan apalagi yang lebih bahaya jika udah taruh di bank terus dilakukan digunakan untuk uh, personal needs gitu loh. Udah nggak bisa bedain tuh antara uh, corporate needs dan personal needs. Nah ini yang um, banyak kan startup founders yang nggak wise akhirnya merusak. Uh, burn rate-nya dia sendiri atau runway-nya dia sendiri. Tapi ada cara juga kamu bisa mengekspektifkan aset ini gitu loh sebenarnya. Contohnya kamu maintain sebagian dari uh, startup fund, funding ini, kamu maintain ke uh, aset-aset yang lebih menghasilkan return yang jauh lebih baik seperti reksadana pasar uang. Nah, strateginya dilakukan sekitar contoh anggap aja di 40-60%, lalu turun ke secara bertahap sebesar 10% selama 3 bulan. Nah, itu mungkin bisa dapat return yang baik dengan um, um, persen Return adalah sekitar 6% gitu. Misalkan um, ditetapin di US 30 dolar lah untuk pengalokasian 40-60 dolarnya itu. Berapa sih burn rate dari uh, burn rate dan runway dari startup itu contohnya? Nah, kalau dilihat nih kan contoh uh, kas di bank kamu di bulan pertama adalah 40% karena kamu siapin duit paling nggak buat uh, uh, jika ada something happen ya di 20 ribu dolar di bank lalu. Uh, kamu punya 30 ribu dolar di mutual fund, di reksana pasar uang, yang hasilnya return yang jauh lebih baik. Kalau kamu taruh di bank aja, mungkin return-nya around, cuma 0,1 persen. Gitu. Saya assume bahwa ini dolar sama rupiah ini sama, ya, jadi return-nya akan sama, uh, interest rate-nya. Nah, 
Nah, jika kamu taruh di reksadana pasar uang yang cukup stabil dan kamu bisa uh, cukup liquid, kamu bisa mendapatkan kalau in total, kamu bisa mendapatkan efektif bond rate yang jauh lebih baik gitu loh. Misalkan di 4.900 instead of 5.000. Nah, ini adalah salah satu uh, tips and trick yang kamu bisa lakukan gitu. Jadi jangan taruh uang kamu hanya pure di kas di bank aja. Nah, mungkin kamu bisa allocate itu ke uh, uh, instrumen-instrumen yang jauh lebih menghasilkan return yang jauh lebih baik gitu. Nah, Uh, ini ada tools-tools yang lainnya juga yang bisa kamu consider, um, yaitu Sero dan Jurnal. Nah, uh, ini daily yang um, aku juga gunain untuk uh, melakukan pembukuan gitu. Karena ini bisa membantu kamu dari segi budgeting, kamu bisa monitor langsung dari HP, uh, terus um, bookkeeping-nya pun jauh lebih mudah di apply AI uh, technology as well gitu. Nah, hal-hal ini yang bisa kamu lakukan untuk uh, mengatur dan membantu masalah pembukuan kamu dari segi money management. Oh, ini just a company summary. Oke. Okay. Oh, oke. Okay. Uh, dari QR ini aku ada provide um, apa namanya um, semacam um, e-commerce model. Jika kalian ingin melakukan projection atau everything, um, kalian scan aja ini, lalu di save aja. Nah, itu bis, uh, bisa kamu gunain untuk melakukan financial projection gitu. Di situ udah, udah kasih detail, detail lebih lengkap tentang um, projection bagaimana e-commerce sebuah perusahaan e-commerce itu gitu. Silakan di save aja kalau ada yang mau. That's all. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you, Ben, for sharing with us. Uh, banyak banget insightnya. There's lots of insights uh, coming from Ben about what the importance of money management is, and that like what are the strategy in a sense that you guys as the founders itu uh, can have a really strategic move regarding manage your uh, funding or basically like your finance uh, and then like there's lots of uh, tips and also tools that uh, Ben just share with us including like a uh, Makari a journal by Makari and also Zero. So uh, I'm going to uh, start the Q&A session. So I would like to invite Pita uh, on the stage again. Hi Pita, are you there? Yes, I'm All here. All right. Right, uh, so we're gonna start uh, to have a Q&A session. We have uh, like several questions uh, on the chat box. I might want to read those questions first and then later on, uh, people also, uh, the audiences can also uh, have a perspective or uh, having a follow-up questions is also allowed. The first uh, questions uh, coming from Eva, uh, I think it will be a better Uh, to address uh, Ben's to address these questions, or later on, Pita, you can have a you know um, case study regarding it. I know that you have been working with lots of startups uh, in Australia. You may uh, share a, a bit perspective regarding it. So the question is: uh, Is there any tips to calculate a uh, growth rate or profit rate, and what are the important things we have to look up to uh, while we're working on a uh, you know? calculating the growth rate and also a uh, profit rate of our startups. Benz, you might want to address it first. Okay. When you're calculating the growth rate, actually you need to consider the historical growth rate perhaps before you performing the projection growth rate that um, not that not, not, that not consider unreasonable. So this is the factor that you need to consider what kind of similar uh, industry yang punya, uh, mm -hmm. having the same business. And then um, try to benchmark from, from that industry. Um, that's how you can calculate much more actual or reasonable growth rate. Yeah. Maybe Peter want to add up a bit. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult one to do um, calculating because it depends again what business. Some have different growth rates depending on the industry and then also have the ability to scale at a different rate from what from what they started so there is no there's no one formula but what I would say though when it comes to investment um, what I have seen go wrong is when an investor is investing into a sector or with some sort of a technology that they are not familiar with and their expectations of growth isn't realistic with the sector or the business that they are dealing with Um, so I would always, my suggestion is to always seek multiple 
points of reference and feedback. Mm -hmm. Have lots of discussions. Take your time in talking to different investors about their expectations on those types of things. Plus also the domain knowledge. Often the founder is coming from the sector who has the domain knowledge or the experience to know what is possible in a certain sector. From the out and outside looking in, sometimes it can seem that something may be able to scale very quickly or their growth rate could be faster than what it actually is. Yet the person with the experience in that sector does know better on how fast something can actually scale. Mm -hmm. Right. So if I might sum up, uh, the first thing we have to do is actually look up to the track record before uh, growth uh, previously and then like accordingly. And uh, before we say to the, or, or we have a further discussions about the growth expectations to the fundraiser, uh, sorry, to the funder, we might also want to talk to other people and have a, a little bit of perspective how their experiences is, whether or not what we said is um, on the a green light or you know on the safe space for us that we might be able to achieve it or not you know just to have a uh putting a bit of uh you know complexity on it but like make sure that uh we don't uh, over promise uh our our funder correct uh Pita and Benz yes the yeah, yeah. um two things are that often in pitching to make the set to make the um the deal or the opportunity sound very attractive, mm -hmm. you may oversell uh, what's possible, over, oversell what you are going to achieve, which means you're just going to put yourself under a very large amount of pressure trying to meet those expectations or milestones um, or expectations of whoever it is who has invested. So sometimes it's better to, um, you know, under promise and over deliver and then readjust as you go and have opportunities to go back in and assess those milestones and see if they're working according to plan. Right, right. Okay, the second will ask uh, the questions directly or uh, would you rather me to read that? Is Bayou still here? Do you mean the B2B, B2C um, question? Not that one. I think it's it's the uh, esti the burn rate estimations uh, that need to prepared by startups. I think it's it's related to what is the healthy burn rate uh, a startup should have um, usually. What are what are the standard of a healthy burn rate? Uh, Benz or Pita, you might uh, address to that. Again, I, it's not. There is. There's not one number that's mm -hmm. healthy. It's healthy in relation to that mm -hmm. team. So it's going to be if you are spe if you are um, spending way too much on advertising, or you have too many people, when you know that you possibly could do more with a less amount of people to reduce your burn rate to go longer, then sometimes you have to make those tough decisions. Investors from the outside will look at what you are spending make an assessment on whether they think that is realistic or not. If the marketing spend is working towards getting you more customers, then perhaps that's a good amount. If you're spending a large amount on, on marketing and you're not actually increasing the, the sales funnel or getting more people in, then that is something that could you, you could be um, burning more, more money than you need to be doing. And you could pull back on that and focus on putting on a new person to code more product to increase a functionality piece or roll, roll out a new feature. So it, it is very variable depend, depending on each business. Mm -hmm. um, but having an external person look at what you are spending your money on is quite a healthy exercise to do. Okay, so if I might, if I might uh, summarize your what you're saying is it's actually based on uh, each of industry that um, you're currently running and then like the second thing you need to look up is actually just to manage the expectations towards um the burn rate itself uh whether or not it is suitable for uh you know the team itself or uh the team and also the 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 feces are the investors right yeah okay maybe, maybe i want to add up perhaps um on in terms of the burn rate 
when you're doing the burn, um, when you're doing the burning cast, cast burning, you need to consider what, what is the things that you want to achieve. Maybe the KPI, what kind of the met, conversion metrics, what is the conversion rate that you want to achieve before you determining the burn rate. So, um, up, is it the right? Uh, is it to achieve certain uh, to achieve certain conversion rate? Uh, ha have you already mm -hmm. considered the correct burn rate? Yet? That's that's the thing that you would consider when you um, burning your mind. Yeah, that's part of it. Okay. Um, we have another questions. Uh, coming from Ari. Ari Nurul, do you want to address your questions directly, Ari Nurul? Okay, uh, or we can start with eco-friendly. Uh, it's the questions regarding the B2B and also uh, B2C, uh, sorry, B2C and B2B commerce, eco-friendly, do you want to address yourself, uh, address your questions directly? Um, so I'll speak to that one because I know plug and play and uh, in Silicon Valley, and I know a lot of companies that have been through plug and play. Mm -hmm. And although it may seem like a lot of equity that they are requesting to take in, re in return for investment, oh, yeah. um, it something else you need to consider is in addition to the $150,000 investment that you're going to get from them, mm -hmm. what else are you going to get with that relationship? So with plug and play, for example, they have access to, and they often showcase all of the startups that they invest in to a range of high profile corporate partners. And you are in the front row seat of being mm -hmm. exposed to their network. Mm -hmm. So although it seems like $150,000 of capital for 30% return, but what else could you get from that? Maybe it could be a large corporate partner. Maybe your follow-on funding could come from an introduction made by Plug and Play. And those are the types of situations where, yes, it may seem very expensive, um, but what else can you get out of that situation? It's like when someone gets invested um, by any of the other larger VCs, who are they now in? Who are they now in the network of that will get you further exposure that you wouldn't normally be able to do on your own? And if you did have to do that on your own, how much time, how much energy, how many resources on the team are you going to spend on pitching to other Silicon Valley investors when merely being part of plug and play could put you into that realm. I'm not saying it's a good deal for you because I still don't know their situation, but maybe looking at what else can come from that relationship as well, because it's not just going to be the $150,000 investment. All right, Benz, do you have something to address before I close the sessions? Um, yeah, yeah, well, basically, um, I agree with Peter. Well, what kind of synergy benefit that you can get when you entering the plug and place ecosystem? Because it will be an NCL sale matter. Because um, that's how you might be able to scale your business um, after you having the fund injected by plug and play. Because um, they will be want to get their money back as in the return. All right. So. Despite just uh you know just calculating the money, you also need to project what what's coming ahead from them actually, right? So yeah. I think that will be all of the questions that we choose to um you know answer today. And you guys, if you have any further questions to Peter or to Vance, kindly connect to them on LinkedIn. I believe like they will be welcoming you guys to ask like uh connect and like ask uh, for further questions regarding you know financials and also managing. Uh, cash flow, how to fundraise, uh, you know, your, your first round of um, fundraising probably. And I really thank you again, Pita and Vance for joining us on the Women Create program. And also thank you all the supporters, uh, Asian Grand Scheme and also our uh, program partner, Stellar Women. And before I, you know, um, closing, the entire sessions. I would like to invite all of you uh, audiences to open your camera and having a photo sessions with Peter and also Vance. Do you mind guys? 
Um, I want to wait for a minute to open the cameras for all of you so we can uh, have a nice picture to be posted on our social media. <laughs> on um anyone can uh, just directly open your camera i see uh some people already opened their camera but like some of them are not yet opening its camera so others might want to join uh okay there's a few Okay, then uh, I think I'm just going to go ahead and uh, screenshot the screen right now. Um, so please uh, have a nice smile. I'm going to count from one, two, three. All right, once more. One, two, three. All right, thank you guys for tuning in. And also we have a feedback form that you have to fill out. Uh, Zetura, you might want to present again uh, about the feedback form. So um, you guys might want to go to bit.ly slash feedback form M2, or you just can scan this uh, QR code here. Uh, we will also share this uh, feedback form to your email as a on the thank you email, I believe, and you can access it uh, right away. Again, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Vance, for sharing with us. Uh, thank you once more thank for uh, Asian uh, Australian Grand Scheme and also a Stellar Woman and the sponsoring and also supporting uh, this program. I wish to meet all of you guys uh, on the third uh, master classes of Women Create by Kompol. I'm Kaisar Ahmad. I'm signing off. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Kaisar. Bye, thank, thank you. you Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Have a nice weekend, all. Have a nice weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.